so just let me know um so yeah i'm going to talk about why i think python is not easy and why i hope and i hope this talk will help you think that it is easy when you actually do open source that's the aim of this talk so what do i do um i'm sadhna shrinivasan i work in ai and ml research at a company called sama um sama works in optimizing clinical trials using um ai and ml um currently i'm trying to figure out if uh, neural networks can be forced to follow hard logic they're famously um something that you cannot control but um we're, we're trying to work on that um the talk is based of simpy it's based of some work that i did for the company using simpy um the idea was to be able to run neural networks on a quantum computer um in a nice and intuitive way um we had to use simpy for that but it was too slow and we had to optimize it so this is things that i encountered um when i had to work with it so why do we say that python is a really easy language it's it's very easy to learn um you spend 25 hours 14 hours and you you you're good to go you can start uh building web servers you can start building apps and um it's very intuitive to use and once you have some experience you can also predict how other libraries with all of their awesome functions are going to behave you you know it's going to be as simple as import something um instantiate an object give the object some data taking a uh, scikit learn as an example and then fit it so you can expect that sort of simplicity and that's why python is so easy but i say that python is not easy um like we saw in the um keynote today python is was not meant to do what it is doing right now and it's grown in complexity over time and all of that complexity is still happening behind the scenes where the end user does not really see it but as an open source first time open source contributor you're going to have to deal with some of that complexity and this talk is centered around concepts that you will encounter when you start doing this so in this talk i'm going to touch upon inheritance in python i'm going to talk about mix in classes which is a good to know and it is not a feature of python then we're going to talk about decorators slots um meta classes and then i'm going to talk about just a bit about what simpy is and um how all of this combines in the simpy code base so we all know what inheritance is um let's say you have three classes you have a class person uh, which could be inherited by a class royalty and then you can have the queen of england who in inherits from um the class royalty so this is nice linear inheritance we know this um but python allows multiple inheritance and most other languages don't allow this and the reason they don't allow this is because um if you look at the class e that i have in this diagram which is an example inheritance flow that you could see in python um you have class e which is inheriting from d and c and it can also inherit and d and c in turn have inherited from b and also a so any property that a has uh both d and c are going to have and when it comes to e you don't you're not really sure which property to keep but this obviously works in python this is a toy example so i have parent class 1 and parent class 2 both have the exact same attribute parent name and i am instantiating a child class which inherits from parent class 1 and 2 now when i check this particular attribute it it prints out e now this is due to um python's dynamic ordering which has a system for how uh, the attributes of different classes are overridden when we do inheritance so whenever you do multiple inheritance if there is a clash the leftmost class or the first class that you gave into that inheritance is the one whose properties are going to get preserved so that's all about inheritance and i'm going to talk about mix in classes um this is not a feature of python you will not find this documented anywhere as such it's just something that you kind of encounter in different code bases um simpy is one django is another what they essentially mean is um it's it's a nice way of encapsulating behaviors so let's say you have um for example taking simpy as an example let's say you have um 
different expressions polynomials um you have um integrals all of these expressions can be evaluated so the behavior that something can be evaluated um can be put in a separate class and whichever other class needs that behavior can just take this um extra class and mix it in so that behavior gets mixed in the reason this is done is that it makes the code base is very readable once you see a mix in class you know it's a repeated behavior that occurs in the code base and when you read really huge code bases this can be very helpful if it exists in the code base so um now i am going to talk about decorators so um before that everything in python is an object every single thing in python is an object so functions are also objects so functions are an object of type function and they have no other attributes but since functions are objects you could also do something like this which is very pointless i don't think you should do it but you can do this just add an extra attribute to a function you can do it but since functions are objects you can pass functions as input to other functions and this is the basis of what decorators are so here you have the decorator function which takes another function as its input and it, it this one times the function so i i check the time at the beginning and i check the time at the end print the difference so this this way of using functions as decorators is syntactic sugar for saying decorator function of this long process that i have defined so it will run this long process and print out my the amount of time it took uh so why would we use decorators it's it's repeatable you have this function that will always time something so you can just wh whichever function you want to time you can just decorate it with this function and it will work so you could also use classes as decorators um except when you're using a class as a decorator you'd have to modify the call function and let's say you have a class error check so you have to initialize it saying that yes you're going to get a function as an input and you're going to tell um whatever else you want to happen you're going to have to do it in call and here i'm saying okay i want to check the parameters and i want to make sure all of them are uh, of the type um are not string basically so i have another function which is add numbers and i decorate that with error check so the first one will run if i say add 1 2 3 it'll run as expected but if i try one string 2 and 3 that's going to throw up an error and uh, again decorators help whenever you know you you want to make things very repeatable so you can also decorate classes i don't have an example for that here but um how many of you have used pytest yeah all of us okay a lot of us so you could actually reimplement pytest um using um decorators you could say okay i have this particular class i want to test it and every you can encapsulate all of the tests in different classes decorate each of those classes so that whenever you run test you can just run each of those functions so decorators allow you to do this sort of thing um you could also do things like check which functions are used more often um whenever a function is called you modify a global variable or you modify something which gives you a count of how many times this function is used so you can use decorators in many different ways you can use them in very creative ways um and these are some things that you will always see um and each uh, yeah so i'm i'm going quite fast so in case someone wants to stop me please feel free so now i'm going to talk about slots this is where classes don't behave like classes anymore so when you have sorry when you have a normal class in python this is a normal class which is a person you have a name you have an age and i'm saying that by default everybody is a coder and i have a normal in it i have an object and i try to add an attribute to that object and all of this works this is behavior that we are all very familiar with for classes um here i'm just uh, showing all of the attributes of the dick of each of these objects so bezos is an object and you have the name age 
and the extra attribute that we just added. Um, I'm also showing you the attributes of the class person. Since person is also an object, it will also have an attribute dictionary. So you check that you have your name, age and coder, which is just here. If coder has a default value, that's already here. So this is how it looks. But it's going to look slightly different with slots. So the way I define it is I'd say I have a class person which has three different slots. Same in it, there's absolutely no change. Same way we initialize objects, there's no change. Um, I'm printing the um, attribute dictionary of person before. Um, and then I'm trying to add an attribute to that object. As you see, this will fail. And if you check um, the attribute of person, you'll see that age becomes a particular member. It, it's not just something that, it's not a placeholder anymore. <coughs> so what is actually happening? So by default, Python will use a dictionary and whenever you use a dictionary, it's mutable. You can add attributes and you can add attributes at runtime, you can change them. But since it is um, so mutable, it also slows down the whole process. But when you use slots, you're telling Python, hey, look, don't do all this. I know I'm only going to use these three slots or these four slots. You can go ahead and allocate memory for this. And why do we do this? Because one, it, um, the, uh, the use of RAM becomes much better optimized. Things run much faster. And if you have a really huge code base and you're entirely sure about exactly how the class is supposed to be used, you can prevent accidental misuse of classes. You won't have an obscure part of the code where somebody just does something with some attribute and you don't, know, you don't see it anywhere else. You won't have that. Now, um, why would we do this? So let's, let's take SymPy. Um, SymPy has symbols and it, it has multiple other classes which get initialized before symbols get initialized. And there are classes in SymPy which for normal use will get you to easily a hundred different objects that exist at the same time. So slots help optimize all that. You don't want your system crashing. So slots help with that. So. Um, now I am actually going to talk about meta classes and this is where I slow down. Um, in Python, most uh, every class is of type type. Classes, class definitions are objects and they are objects of type type. And this enables all of the default behavior that we see. Um, we see by default we have init, we have call, we have all of these behaviors that we are used to. This is what enables all of those behaviors. Meta classes allow programmers to take control of all of these behaviors. So this is just an example. I have a example class and I check the type of that example class and it's of type type. This is a bit of syntax. So how do we define a meta class? Any class that inherits from type is a meta class. So you inherit from type and then you change whatever behavior you want to change. You don't want to have to change and define every single behavior every time. So that's why it's done like this. Um, we also have to tell Python that, look, we're not going to inherit from object. We're not going to, we're going to have our own meta class defined. So this is a class meta. This is, so you have class meta, which inherits from type. And all I'm doing here is that every time an object is initialized, I'm saying I want this attribute to be added. And so I have a class where I'm defining that meta class. This is how you specify it. There's no other definition there. Initialize an object. And then when I print brown.coder, voila, you see true. Uh, but when you, see, when you check the type of that object, it's no longer um, it's no longer of the usual type object. It, it's of type main meta. It's dunder main dunder because <coughs> this meta class was defined in main. And yeah. So this is another much better example of how meta classes could be used. Um, this is the same example that I mentioned before in decorators. We can, sorry, we can use meta classes to keep track of objects um, which get initialized in certain classes. Um, 
and we image the idea is we want to keep track and we want to know the number of um, objects and the number of ways in which a different class is being used. So here I have a global variable models and I have a meta class which will update this global variable every time a new um, object is initialized and then I have a class model which inherits this meta class and when I when I initialize it and afterwards I check the um, global variable I have that automatically updated. You could also do this with decorators like I mentioned before but it's just that I personally find this cleaner um, and every anything that you inherit from model will inherit the same behavior so I find this a little bit cleaner. So yeah this could be achieved by a decorator but that's not as clean. But meta classes are way more powerful. You can you can change the sorry, I think I skipped this slide. No. Uh, you can change the basic structure of a class itself. So um, this we we just saw that you have um, the classes are you classes use dictionaries. Suppose we have to process that dictionary and for some reason we don't want it to be a dictionary but we want it to be an ordered dictionary. Meta classes will allow you to change things like that. Here um, again, I'm defining a meta class, and since I'm changing the way the class itself, the objects are going to be, I change prepare, and instead of returning a normal dictionary, it's going to return an ordered dictionary. This in this case, um, I'm changing you just to print out the list of attributes that are there. Um, there's nothing really going on there, and I have a class A. This one has a meta class. It has a few attributes. And if you look at the um, attributes list, you see that um, it's, it's all ordered. And that, that was the point of this example. And you can, you can change this to anything. You, you, want, um, you want ordered dictionary. You need it to be some sort of dictionary or tuple or something like that. But other than that, you, you have complete control. Um, you can also change the base class. So going back to the initial example that I used with inheritance, um, you have the class Queen of England which has inherited from um, royalty and royalty has inherited from person. Now we obviously do want Queen of England to also identify as person which means we want its base class to also be person. So if you want to manipulate the base class, if you want to manipulate the name of a class, all of that meta classes allow you to do. So here in, in this case you have to change new. So um, here you can you can change what the meta class is to here um, for record keeping. So here I'm um, instead of returning just the object, I'm saying I want you to define it in this way. I want to change the name to foo, and I want to change the base class to int. And so I have uh, a base class which has the meta class, this meta class, and then you have class A which inherits from base class, and you have class B which inherits from A. So by default, if you try to check is B a subclass of base class, it won't evaluate true. But here I'm checking A is named foo, B is named foo, the outputs are below. And you also check, try to check is B a subclass of A, now that will evaluate to false because basis is empty with uh, except for int. And is B a subclass of int? Yes, B is a subclass of int because we've defined it to be that way. Um, a word of caution, meta classes are really powerful, they are really flexible, but they add a lot of complexity to the code and especially it becomes very hard to read code. Um, you, you might use a meta class now and then you inherit five other classes from it and um, you, you keep using and then you inherit from those classes. Um, the behavior of the meta class is propagated, but for you to actually figure out that this particular object is behaving weirdly because somebody has changed the beta class downstream somewhere can get really hard for someone. So use it with a pinch of salt, but if you can't find any other solution, this is the way to go. So um, this is, I'm just going to touch upon what SymPy is. Um, SymPy is symbolic Python. Um, we all have done symbolic mathematics, which is the mathematics that we use in school. You have symbols X, Y, and Z, and you try to solve for them in some way, and you manipulate those symbols without actually knowing what value they carry. So SymPy lets you initialize symbols. 
so they're the fundamental thing in SymPy. So here I have three variables and um, I'm solving this particular equation which is sine x minus x and I can even define a domain. I can say hey um, solve this equation within this domain. And you can also do solving of linear equations where you can define those equations, say solve for x, y, and z. You can get those answers. So this is what SymPy does. SymPy does all sort of symbolic mathematics. Um, it's similar to Wolfram. It's similar to other things that you've seen. So I said I worked with SymPy. This is a bit of SymPy's inheritance tree. SymPy has around 1,200 classes, 1,700 classes, something like that. This is a part of it. This is what I had to work with mostly. So um, I, I had to work with like around 1,000 symbols at the same time and manipulate all of them. And we wanted to make that um, asynchronous and we wanted to add some properties to help speed up things further. So that's when we hit up on slots. We realized we can't just add properties. And that's when we realized meta classes also exist. And managed properties is not going to behave like a normal class. And that property starts propagating. Um, you also have evalf mixin, which is the only thing that kind of helped, where you have um, this is the point where a function gets evaluated. And that's, I that's inherited by addition, subtraction, multiplication and all of them have this. So you change a valve mix and everything works. And every, every, anything that inherits that is, is going to work just like that. Um, so this is mostly what I have to say. Um, I, I wanted, I, we've talked about inheritance. We've talked about a lot of things. We've talked about inheritance, mix in classes, decorators, um, meta classes. We've talked about how they could be used and are used in SymPy. And yeah, I think we're open to questions. Do we have questions? Oh, sorry. Do we have questions? Yeah. Someone saying something, but I can't hear it. Hi. Yeah. Am I audible? Yeah, you are. Yeah, so about the mix-in classes, can you elaborate on that? Is it like calling the super function or... No, it's it's just a convention. Um, I'm, I'm going to take this off. So it's just a convention. Um, it's like, it's just something that people do, uh, which makes code bases more maintainable and more readable. It is not a feature of Python. It's not involved with super. It's just a class that you define. Um, let's say you have, um, okay, let's say you're, you're doing something in, uh, which, which models all of the people and you're going to have an object, f a class for every person in the world. And there is a property that people can read instead and they can read different things. Um, people can read English, people can read Hindi. There's, there's a lot of different things that reading can do. But you can just keep this, but everybody reads in the same way. You see something, you do some processing and you read. So you, you isolate that behavior reading as um, read mix in maybe. And then whenever you have a class person who can read, you just mix that behavior in. Um, and presumably you'll have languages that they can read, etc. as attributes which will, which will then be processed. So that... It, it's a way to isolate behavior so that the code is really readable. Uh, hi, uh, here, back in, here in the back. Okay, hi. Hi, hi, hi sir. Uh, thank you. It was a great. Q and A. So, uh, so you have questions? Yeah, over here. Uh, uh, first row. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I'm getting some interference. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so at the beginning, uh, you uh, when you were talking about SymPy, you m had mentioned something about uh, hard logic in neural networks. Yeah. Uh, could you elaborate on that? Uh, possibly uh, show some references uh, to any research papers you are working on. Uh, for the research papers, you just just Google neural networks and logic. You're gonna get a lot of them. Um, symbolic logic in neural networks. Um, basically what it is is that um, neural networks are really hard to control and their behavior becomes undefined beyond certain boundaries um, the this research is to basically um, 
not have that happen and have some control over the way neural network behaves despite you know the um inputs that we get we can talk about this later i don't think it's directly related we can talk about it yeah any question yeah yeah so this is regarding uh, meta programming so uh, i also use a lot of meta classes in my work so there is one problem that i have not been able to solve is uh, if let's say you are in the main function mm. and there are functions in that main uh, module that are not part of any class okay. so can you control those as part of your uh, meta programming in any way probably i i really don't know okay, you okay. potentially could but i would say please don't use that many meta classes okay <laughs> they're not good for readability they are good for maintainability Th- unless you absolutely have to please don't then okay